Hi, everyone. I'm Salma Qureshi. Welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, the University of Texas at San Antonio's Neuroscience Research Podcast. Today is March 18th, 2021, and we're talking with Sachin Deshmukh, who is a Wellcome Trust Fellow in the Center for Neuroscience at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. And what's your local time there? Hi, Sachin. Hey, uh, it's past uh, It's 12.30 a.m. <laughs> Oh no, you look surprisingly fresh. And thank you for joining us at this late hour. Um, the Deshwick Lab examines how the hippocampal network builds representation in different spatial contexts from entorhinal inputs and the hippocampus's internal circuitry. The lab correlates the activity of individual neurons and populations with ongoing behavior in rodents, navigating environments of varying complexity. Um, so in the Zoom today, we're joined by our own spatial hippocampal specialist, Francesco Savelli. Hi, Francesco. Hi. And reliably, Charles Wilson. Charlie Wilson. Hi, Charlie. Hello. Sachin, your work develops this idea that increasing the complexity uh, of an environment uncovers frank space-related representations in areas of the hippocampal network that are understood generally to be non-spatial or at least not so dominated by a spatial code. Um, and, and I mean, namely the lateral entorhinal cortex and uh, its target regions and distal areas of hippocampal area CA1. And your work is really guided by understanding anatomical relationships as well as um, information content and flow within this network. So can you unpack some of the conceptual motivation that guides this work in terms of, of what you understand as a core operation of hippocampal circuitry? Is it always about space? All right. <laughs> you, 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 you're starting with setting up a nice trap for me, right? If I say it's space and I'm very excited about it, all these memory people are going to be going after me. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, so let, let me just um, uh, back up a little bit. Yeah. So, so what we know is human hippocampus is very much involved in declarative memory, specifically episodic memory. Uh, but when we try to uh, uh, look at what hippocampus does in rodents, because that's a much more accessible system wherein you can stick in electrodes and allow the animals to run around and so on, you see that uh, the, the strongest correlate that comes out is that of space. But, but what we see is on top of this spatial variable, there are a lot of other variables that tend to get layered in order to create a much more complex representation than just that of uh, here is where I am at any given moment. Um, so much of my work uh, actually sort of elaborates on, 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 on this notion. Uh, we, we start with the very basic thing that when you allow an animal to run around and stick in an electrode in the hippocampus, what you see is different neurons fire at different locations. But once you've gone beyond that, what you start seeing is that these neurons, in addition to representing where you are, they also start representing your interactions with the, the world you live in. So for example, uh, if a particular object was at a certain location and, it, and it's no longer at that location anymore, you'll start seeing uh, hippocampal place cells modify their activities at that location. Neurons that did not fire at that location might start firing. Neurons that already fired at that location might increase their activity or decrease their activity. Uh, your ensemble activity at that location might change. Uh, and, and, that's your, this, and that's your work. You're being very modest. That's actually really important work that, that yeah. you did. And, and, and what seems to happen is that, uh, well, well, well ju just to clarify this, this thing, the hippocampus representing this, uh, uh, this misplaced kind of activity, that work actually comes from O'Keefe right back in 70s. Uh, what my work shows is, of course, in my work also I've shown this, but a number of other people have shown this after O'Keefe. What, what my work shows is that this pattern, the misplaced activity that you see in the hippocampus is also seen a stage before in the lateral entorhinal cortex. So, so what, is, what is happening is 
that lateral entorhinal cortex has object related activity neurons that fire at objects but in addition it also has uh, uh, has conjunctive representations of where a object used to be for example uh, so it's no longer there so sensory information is not available and yet lateral entorhinal cortex has this uh, correlate of where the object used to be so so what this tells us is that hippocampus is not the first time in this network that you have conjunctive representation of non spatial and spatial variables that seems to happen at at least one stage earlier in the lateral entorhinal cortex uh, we've looked for the same kind of thing can we push it farther back and we've looked for it in the perirhinal cortex and we did not see it but that does not necessarily mean that lateral entorhinal cortex is the first stage because there are multiple other inputs to the lateral entorhinal cortex that we have not looked at uh, perirhinal cortex is the obvious input to look at and therefore we looked at it but uh, but it might be inheriting it from somewhere else it might be the actual interaction between the lateral entorhinal cortex the hippocampus and the medial entorhinal cortex that is generating this kind of representation we need to start doing uh, uh, manipulations that that will allow us to address causal relationships like does turning off hippocampus for example get, uh, get rid of this kind of misplaced kind of representations in the lateral entorhinal cortex which will tell us that you it's not just the lateral entorhinal cortex but the interaction between hippocampus and lateral entorhinal cortex that is necessary and i have something very elementary about objects so mm -hmm. they say that the lateral entorhinal cortex neurons have an object related response i guess that means that the, the cells fire when the animal is in is interacting with that object or is mm -hmm. so so what's the nature of that interaction does the animal actually have to touch the object or brush yeah. against it or what right so 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 uh, so uh, here is the problem with the way that we do these experiments right there's an overhead camera animal is running around you have leds on top of the animal's head and you are monitoring the leds okay so you can't really uh, you don't have the kind of uh, resolution to see what the animal is really doing all we know is how close the animal is and how fast it's moving uh, as far as those uh, the quantitative analysis are concerned but when we while recording while performing these experiments when you look at what the animals are doing uh, you you get all kinds of interactions uh, you get interactions wherein the animals are walking right over the object they are sniffing the, the objects sometimes uh, they are trying to eat the objects um, um, and then it it also depends on the specific object that is being used for example in uh, early sort of pilot experiments that i was doing with the lateral entorhinal cortex i had this dora the explorer doll that i was using it was about yet tall uh, uh, and uh, so so what happened was the rats would just look at that doll and turn around and book it like go as far as possible so after a couple of animals like this are, these are animals without implant so nothing much lost but uh, just uh, while looking at it i said okay i don't want dora the explorer anymore in my experiment but uh, there were other animal uh, other uh, organisms in there there were animals like there's a, a fish made of sponge and there's a little camel in the experiment and with both those animals uh, you saw very different interactions between the rat and the object like with other objects they would approach it from anywhere and everywhere but with the fish it was right at the eye like the uh, rat would go right for the eye and start biting at the eye or right below the eye so my later animals would would encounter that fish with like big chunks of <laughs> sponge missing right on the under the eye uh, the camel was luckier because it was a harder object so nothing uh, got lost with that interaction but it was mostly the interaction with the mouth so so interactions themselves are specific to specific objects on how the animal perceives them 
but unfortunately, at least the way we were doing those experiments, we didn't have the resolution to. So what do you think the neuron firing means? Is the neuron firing mean I'm in the same location as that object? Because if this is a location system, mm -hmm. then I mean, that, that location exists. The animal sees the object long time before it gets close to it. It knows it's there. So mm -hmm. encoding the presence of the object by that neuron doesn't seem like what the neuron's doing if the mm -hmm. neuron has to be right up on the object before it starts to fire. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just sort of trying to figure out what, what in the world the, the, the this isn't a place field, it's an object field or something like that, mm -hmm. um, what that means. Right, so, so it, this is actually a very important question and you've got, uh, uh, got the weasel words that I was using. I kept saying object related activity, but never committing to like uh, what exactly it is, right? And, 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 the, the, and the reason for that is what we see, uh, as you mentioned, neurons fire at objects. But what we see is when we look at it across sessions, these neurons that fire at objects tend to change their activity at different objects. So uh, I, I typically have four objects in the environment and manipulation sessions, I might have more or objects at different locations, but standard sessions, there are four objects in the environment. Let's say in first session, first standard session, you have uh, neurons fire, one particular neuron firing more at object one and less at objects two, three, and four. In the following session, the neuron might fire much more at objects two and three than object one and four. And that keeps changing. Uh, uh, when there is novel object or misplaced object, you can see uh, activity at the novel look object or at the misplaced object, but it's not necessarily always that there is much more activity at the novel object or the misplaced object. Uh, so it, it just might be that we are completely missing out on the actual nature of, of this code. It might be encoding either animals interaction with the object it might be encoding the fact that the animal is paying attention to the object. The attention might vary from session to session or even from a specific encounter to another, right? One, one encounter, the animal might be trying to look for, there is a food pellet but, uh, kind of stuck right under the object. Another encounter, it might be sniffing and interacting with the object. Yet another interaction, it might be, I just need to get over this object onto the other side because there is more food on the other side. These are hungry rats after all. Um, so we don't really know what is going on, except to say that uh, that it's not as simple as object identity because it's not like the neurons are very selective for unique objects. Uh, it's not a simple spatial location of the object because uh, the activities keep going up and down uh, uh, at, at different objects. Interestingly enough, that variability is much more in the perirhinal cortex than in the lateral entorhinal. Uh, the, the activity levels go up and down a lot more. So, so my hunch is that because lateral entorhinal cortex also starts showing representation of space away from objects, now we start getting place fields, right? And these place fields are extremely stable. Like uh, if you look at it uh, from session to session, uh, if you look at uh, correlations between uh, uh, between these rate maps uh, in first session, session, second session, third session, and so on, so on, uh, these uh, place cells in LEC, which is very small fraction of neurons, uh, tend to be very very stable, whereas the object cells tend to show lower, but lower correlation of the order of a Pearson correlation of 0.5 or so. Where, as against 0 0.8, 0 0.9 kind of correlations seen in the place cells. Uh, but if you look at perirhinal cortex, these correlations are much, much lower. Even the object cells in perirhinal cortex uh, show uh, much lower correlations. So it, it looks to me like, uh, uh, like because there is confluence of space and object kind of thing, there is some sort of stabilization of uh, representations there in 
in lateral interrhinal cortex compared to perirhinal cortex, but uh, but it might just still be uh, like uh, that. Uh, our experiments were still not uh, sensitive enough or not specifically directed at looking at exactly what it is about the object or interaction of the animal with the object. Uh, there was never an instance when these objects simply became landmarks. And in, in your task, it was the object was always the target in, in this exploration. Task. Uh, well, no, no, no. So object was not a target. In fact, if anything, in my experiment, the object was an obstacle in the sense that these are hungry animals. Uh, we sprinkle food around in the environment and they're looking for food. Uh, we are explicitly not putting in any kind of uh, goal uh, motivation. Like if you go to an object, you will get a reward. We are, we are not putting any kind of this thing, or we are not put, uh, imputing any uh, kind of significance to the object in terms of, in order to reach your goal, you need to turn left at this object for it to act as a landmark. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just there in the environment and the animal figures out what it wants to do with the object. Uh, I, I, I told you about different interactions the animal has with the object. Uh, earlier, uh, so uh, so it's kind of driven by the animal. Uh, but what we do see is that uh, we already see these landmark vectors being represented in the hippocampus. We don't see those in the lateral interrhinal cortex, but we see them yeah, uh, in the hippocampus. Uh, that these are neurons that fire at specific distance and direction from individual objects. A single neuron might fire at multiple locations, but each of those locations are, is defined as a function of distance and direction from individual objects in the environment. So, so even if we are not forcing the animal to do some kind of uh, task based on objects, it looks like the hippocampus is already creating representations that might be useful. Now, even, even in the, in the, the, the most basic case we have here, which is, which is that these objects are just obstacles to be avoided, I think these landmark vectors would play a role. If I know that uh, if I go uh, from, from where I am, if I go uh, uh, 10 centimeters to northeast of where I am, I'm likely to hit an object. That is a very useful information for me to use in order to avoid hitting that object when I'm just trying to go around the object and eat food, right? Uh, so we might be getting that kind of representation. I think the good news is that uh, over the last few years, there have been so many tools now, mostly based on uh, deep learning um, or really automating and making it much more accessible to the investigator to be able to um, automatically classify behavioral patterns or track the animal in the entirety of their bodies. And, and so I think, you know, it will become easier and easier to um, characterize in a, in a quantified way, characterize the, those behavioral interactions of the animal with the objects. Get back to the, you know, the question that um, Charlie Asked, you know, it's about okay, what is it about this encoding? You know, what is encoding exactly? I mean, I think in general, <clears throat> there has been an over reliance in the field on um, rate maps, which was a way of um, quantifying the data and visualizing the data that made sense for place cells. That's what they were invented for, right? You know, like you know, now this is a place cell. And the rate map tells you where the cell fires, and but it's an average. It's an average across an entire session. It hides a lot of information. You know, temporally it's a flat representation, and so it hides a lot of things that happen. And usually people use separate measure. You know, uh, bits of information, other stability measures. But for the most part, we were happy with that because we were looking at spatial correlation. And then once you start investigating what other things place cells or cells of the hippocampus can do outside space, we'll still 
we're so used to use these rain maps that we keep, you know, trying to um, fit the phenomenon in the rain maps. But and it has, but still has been fruitful because, for example, your study, the you know, the, the study, the first study with object representation. I mean, that was really a landmark study. But I really hope, you know, going forward, that we can use these new tools to really characterize what's going on and what do these neurons really respond during the animal behavior. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, deep learning tools will be very, uh, very, very handy in terms of like going in without any kind of preformed notions about this is what it should be. And just, just put in all your, all your variables and, and just see what relationships fall out of uh, what is going on and so on. Uh, but I, I should add to what you're saying, which is that if we were to use deep learning on the way we are collecting the data currently, basically just thresholded LED signals, uh, we are still limiting what we can derive from it. We, we, we do need to have a better resolution. Like for example, uh, if we were to actually track the entire bo whole body of the animal, uh, more spatial resolution, more temporal resolution, all those things might help. Uh, so we've, we've talked about this in, in, in the past, for example, about head direction versus heading direction, right? Heading direction is the most relevant signal for path integration rather than head direction. But because of this LED business, we keep track of head direction and we pretend that head direction is uh, enough for what's going on. But I could be looking left and walking forward and guess what? Your path integrator would be performing much better. Real path integrator would be performing much better than the path integrator that you develop based on head direction instead of heading direction. Mike Asimov's theme has studied exactly the different influence of those two things. And mm -hmm. They were saying, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so what are the other dimensions of complexity that you're looking at? What do you mean by environmental complexity? Objects, you just described a couple of levels of complexity within objects themselves. So how do you, how are you, uh, what's the, what are others that you're looking at? Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> So, uh, so, so, so complexity comes in variety of different forms, right? So, so to begin with, uh, the reason why we are even calling these things complex is because it's in contrast to what we try to do in the lab normally. Simplify things so that you have minimum number of variables that you can keep track of. So, so in order to, and, and this whole enterprise, especially in the place cell business, this enterprise began with the idea that we need to prove that the place cells are actually representing the abstract notion of space rather than, uh, rather than re representing individual sensory stimuli. How do you go about doing that? Oh, minimize the sensory stimuli that are available and, and then, the, then, then manipulate them and then see what is going on. So, so the classic experiment consisted of uh, uh, environment devoid of cues except one single cue that you can manipulate. You can remove the cue and show that spatial representation still remains stable. So it's not dependent on the cue to express itself. But at the same time, it is anchored to the cue in the sense that when you rotate the cue, the entire <clears throat> spatial representation rotates. And then it scales with the scale of environment and so on. Uh, so, so, so the entire enterprise was focused on proving that this is an abstract notion. And for that, we ended up simplifying the environment as much as we possibly could. But now what we are seeing is as you make the uh, environment more and more complex, more, uh, as you take it closer and closer to what the animal would encounter in real life, you start seeing more and more complex phenomena beyond simple place field kind of expression. So, so the kind of things that we are talking about here is uh, in, in our lab, what we've done so far is introducing textures uh, in, on the tracks that the animal is running around in, objects we've talked about just now. We've talked about increasing environmental complexity simply by making the environment much larger than what is typically done. Uh, Typical things are one square meter or smaller, so such that the animal can uh, 
see everything very easily and get from one point to the other under a second uh, uh, anywhere in the environment. Uh, but but real life animal runs around in hundreds of uh, meters in each direction, even uh, a kilometer or more. So so increasing spatial scale is one thing. But what we need to eventually get at uh, is, is closer to as real environment as possible, which will involve a, a system of burrows, uh, a bunch of landmarks that are available, things that obscure things, things that the animal needs to avoid, things that the animal uses in order to go about doing its daily business. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so for example, um, uh, this comes from some sort of pest control study trying to see uh, when there is a granary and there are uh, lots of rodents coming in, how, how, how do they go around uh, the world, uh, their world and things like that. So what they, what they found was the animals typically use hidden paths like hedges or burrows and things like that to get to the the food and things like that. So if you make the hedges disappear, the rodent infestation in the granary goes down. Uh, so, 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 so this was the purpose of that experiment, but what that tells us for, for the purpose of, of our thing of understanding uh, uh, representation of space, utilization of space and things like that, is that the valence of different locations changes depending on what the animal needs to do. Uh, an animal is hungry and therefore needs to get to the granary, but, uh, but at the same time, uh, if there is no safe path to get to the granary, the animal is going to weigh those things and decide not to go there. Uh, if we start looking at uh, how the space is, represented under these different conditions, we are likely to see uh, 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 different things. So for example, I mean, this is not related to this, but I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, which is that when uh, Andre Fenton's lab uh, uh, creates this kind of conflicting valence uh, in the space, they see multiple representations existing simultaneously. So for example, what they do is that uh, uh, the animal gets foot shock uh, uh, in the, is it a foot shock or just blow of air at the eye, I forget. Uh, uh, it's a foot shock, I think. Um, uh, when the animal is in, in at a particular physical location, and then there is also a rotating zone. So, so a zone that rotates as a function of time, such that if the animal is found at a particular location at a particular time, it gets a foot shock. So it's got two zones that it needs to keep track of, one zone that is fixed and another zone that keeps rotating with respect to time. What you see is that there are now two spatial maps that are being created, at least two spatial maps that are being created. One that is stable in the external extra world coordinates, and another one that rotates with this uh, rotating cube kind of system. Uh, so, uh, so uh, the complexity of the task drives complexity of representation of space or of other variables that the hippocampal system tends to represent. Are we worried that we could get completely misled about the function of the neurons in the hippocampus just because we have only tested them in these like crazy simple situations. So if the yes. hippocampus is supposed to remember something about space, only testing it in a one square meter place that the animal can see everything about it every mm -hmm. time it's in there isn't really much of a challenge to spatial memory. Yeah. I know there have been experiments where people have studied the hippocampal neurons in more challenging situations. But uh, have, have they revealed, I mean, you just described one with this ro rotating shock, but mm. how about like complicated things that are more like the animal's real world, like a 
a labyrinth of passageways or something like that. Uh, are those, or even three dimensional things mm -hmm. where the animal has to know what floor of a complicated structure it's on, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so what has been shown is, uh, so, so let, let me start with uh, uh, flying bats. Uh, so um, the Israeli groups, I'm sorry, it's too late at night. I'm blanking Ulanowski. out on names. Uh, yeah, Ulanovsky's lab, <laughs> uh, Nakam Ulanovsky's lab. Uh, so they have a 200 meter long tunnel. Uh, it's in kind of an L shape and the bats fly back and forth. And they've shown that there are, uh, 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 there are multiple, individual place cell has multiple place fields and individual place field size tends to be very, very variable. Some place fields are very small of the order of uh, whatever smaller, smallest scale they could measure. I think it was of the order of half a meter or a meter or so on, up to tens of meter kind of uh, spatial scales within a single place cell. Um, in three dimensions, the same lab has demonstrated that uh, that you do see three-dimensional place fields. Uh, the grid cells don't, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, get Jeffrey's lab uh, 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 with uh, rats has also shown three-dimensional place fields like that uh, in, uh, uh, but rats have other limitations, like uh, they're, they're limited by something to grab onto. So if your axes remain in the cardinal X, Y, Z direction to two dimensions of uh, plane and then vertical dimension, then, then you see place fields that are elongated along those dimensions. But if you, if you change the orientation of your uh, matrix, the three-dimensional matrix, so that animals can run around different directions. You can eliminate those um, references. So uh, uh, the grid cells, on the other hand, don't seem to uh, show much of that. So earlier results from Ked Jeffrey's lab uh, uh, and uh, a couple of other labs I'm blanking out on tended to indicate that the grid cells might have columnar representations, that is, the hexagons that you see in plane are simply columns that go uh, upwards kind of thing. But, but when the rats move around in more naturalistic environments uh, or bats fly, um, now there are reports uh, unpublished as such, as far as I know, uh, that just say that it's, you don't see a complex uh, three-dimensional, uh, but repeating representation of grids uh, in three dimensions. So were you, were you down there or? Yeah, go ahead. I could oppose, but you know, I just wanted to add something because this is really a, a, you know, a big question. And in a way I wanna dispel some of, you know, expectations about the cognitive map and the place cell system. So, you know, when, when the Nobel Prize, when, when O'Keefe and, and um, May Breed and Edward Mosers won the Nobel Prize, you, you saw in, in the news, it was explained as the GPS system. So this is the GPS system of the brain, okay? And I do recognize the value of that example to quickly popularize and give an idea for what, you know, the discovery was about. But I was always joking and going and I was like, that's not a global positioning system. That's not what the GPS is. It's the locale positioning system because ever since Nadell and O'Keefe book, the cognitive map was not about space in the sense of, you know, your city or even your building. It was about localis, which means like other people call vistas or depending on the, on the discipline and and, and use of the terms, you know, the scholar uses the terms, but meaning like usually it's space that more or less fits in, within your perceptual horizon, maybe modulo you um, turning around, okay? So it could be like, it doesn't, it doesn't have to do necessarily 
I suppose with physical size, it could be a small room or it could be a large courtroom, right? But it's, it's, it's not like your maids. So they themselves hypothesize that different systems would be dedicated to navigating in you know, complex mazes or, or something like that, potentially supported also by the hippocampus in ways that we might not understand very well and maybe even by place cells. And I think the, even to this day, the most interesting work in that sense in, uh, in neurophysiology is Doug Nitz work with this representation in the posterior parietal cortex where the cells pro, uh, signal progress along a particular route. And he, he did very elegant experiments to show that that's not a representation that is egocentric or a representation that is allocentric, but it's a representation that is route centric, which I didn't even imagine the concept up to then until you know I read his work. So you know this is just something about you know place cells and grid cells, and we know these grid maps and place maps you know fragment. In, in, if you if you use an environment that is structured, the multi compartment, it it oftentimes the map is fragmented. So um, you know something to keep in mind. I mean, I, I admit, and maybe I'm making a mistake about thinking about the hippocampus, but I would claim that it is the propaganda of the hippocampal scientists that makes me think that when I'm going downtown park downtown to go visit the Alamo and there's been a road close and now I can't take my regular route and I can immediately without consulting with my phone because it's a familiar part of town I can immediately pick a new route find my way around and get to my favorite parking place anyway and then I congratulate my hippocampus on helping me with that that's a complete mistake the hippocampus didn't do that at all yeah, well, I mean, we don't know that the hippocampus uh, didn't do that. You know, there is all the hippocampus of taxi drivers in London and hippocampus built sequences, so it could help routes and, you know, so it could be very well involved. What I'm saying is that it's not clear at all that the place cell system, as we think of it, you know, as a positioning system or the grid cell system, as we think about it as a positioning system, as something that encodes position, has you know, it's all the, 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 it, it's all the story there that there is about the example that you just gave. And it's not just, you know, I'm not, I'm not faulting anybody. It's just, you know, even people in the hippocampus, you know, they keep repeating that, not just for especially, them, especially they, people. If they, I read a grant. Even my colleagues, sometimes they forget what, you know, Lynn and Adele, uh, so Lynn Adele and O'Keefe wrote, is O'Keefe and Adele wrote in the, in the original book and how, and, and, you know, all these, nuances in the data. So, and yes, we thought sometimes we just oversimplify because, you know, we want to explain something real quick and, you know, we, we, we use these uh, real um, everyday examples, but, and I, and I'm, I'm at fault too sometimes to do that, but, um, but yes. Especially, it seems like you want to have it both ways to me. So hippocampus guys write a grant saying we should get the money because we can explain how you find your way around town and how that fails in Alzheimer's disease or something. But then when we actually ask you to explain that stuff, you say, oh, oh well, it's not really the hippocampus. The hippocampus has a much more limited scope of function, you know? So I know everybody does this. We, we sort of, in one context, we are context animals. In one context, we exaggerate what we know. And in the next context, we try to back away from it. But uh, but I'd like to actually know, you know, the, how much of that, so the experiments are never seem to be really designed to ask that question. And I understand why, Sachin explained it. You well, can't but, handle the data that you get out of that really complicated experiment. You don't know how no. to analyze it. It's gonna be a nightmare. But, but it is, is, am I paraphrasing you right? That's you I'm mentioned saying. Alzheimer, and so now you're mentioning memory, and it usually when people study memory with place cells, you know, they, stu they study the properties of place cells. So for example, the property of remapping across environments. So like you do create this map. It is a map. It is a legitimate map. 
maps for you know um, in cognitive science that call small scale space versus large scale space or vistas versus and, and, and all these different locale versus that is a legitimate map it's just that it's a one kind of map but usually when people study the mnemonic properties of place cells then they study things like remapping across environment and the, the ability to recall a specific map when you are in a particular environment. And so usually, or for example, things like replay of a, of a route, um, you know, the place cells have the fighting sequentially along a route during sleep or, and, and so on, so that it's linked potentially to memory consolidation. So it's, it's other properties of places people think they have a handle uh, there, there's not many tractable systems in neurophysiology that you can hope to kind of get to the mechanism of that. And that's the window that they use. But there, there's, there's issues of time scale and experience involved here too, aren't there? For example, when we uh, are born and you know, we start going through life and we start building cognitive maps based on experience. We live in a spatial world 100% of the time. We navigate 100% of the time. We build intuitions based on some of those early things potentially, but yet but, but the system that you guys are looking at is so impoverished. It's these animals that grow up in cages that are brought out for a few hours a day early in life to do a very, very stereotyped task usually. Uh, and in the bounds of that, you have the system recruited on overdrive and then it's presumably, is it, I mean, it, it, then it shrinks down to the size of a cage for the rest of, of their lives. It, it always uh, seems to me that you're driving this system, this really naive system at a level and making really broad statements about what this thing is doing in real time across the span of the lifetime. And does that concern anyone at all in this area? And are people using, are people raising animals in naturalistic environments? Because I know in the visual system, enrichment in downtime is really important in doing, in doing certain kinds of visual, uh, visual spatial experiments, right? So, so there, there have been uh, attempts. So for example, uh, Nakamulanovsky's lab that records from bats often catches wild bats and does, does this experiment. But that could have been, you can argue that th that constraint just comes from they didn't have a bat colony to begin with and they had to get bats. That's uh, great. Those are the most exciting studies. Uh, but, but then there are, there are also attempts at making the environment of the rat much more complex and seeing if, uh, if things change, uh, like enriching the environment, having many more animals living together uh, and, and so on. Um, but, but yes, it would be very interesting to see how uh, uh, so to address nature versus nurture kind of uh, uh, questions like catch wild rats and see how the hippocampi represent uh, spa uh, space in our laboratory conditions. Uh, house the same wild rats in cages and then see how it happens. And then take it the other way around that the lab bred rats instead of keeping them in tiny environments. Can you do that in Bangalore? I don't, can you do that here? I, I doubt we could do that here. I well, it, it, it's, 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 it's much more of um, is, issue of like convincing the ethics committees and things like that. But I think it's, it's possible. But, but the real constraint there is, uh, I think, much more of uh, uh, much more of having animals uh, uh, like figuring out the protocol such that uh, how do you go about handling an animal that is not used to being anywhere near humans? Humans are the enemy kind of thing, outside animal, because lab animals, you know what, you you handle them since they're babies and, and they're very used to like, even if you don't personally handle it, the animal handler that is taking care of the animals is routinely handling them. So by the time they're four, five, six months old that you are ready to do experiments on, they are very well broken and used to you. Whereas uh, a, a wild animal is a wild animal. So you need to work out uh, details of that. But, uh, but given that people do uh, kind of uh, studies with wild animals for uh, 
and and fairly invasive studies like extracting brains and looking at uh, what's happening uh, in terms of uh, predator prey interactions and and and, and so on how this uh, the stress affect the brain and things like that so i don't think there is a limit in terms of oh ethics committees will never approve this uh, once you motivate your study well enough i think you should be able to get so those I, things i might be wrong here but um if I, if I remember correctly, uh, Nagumulanowski's lab, they catch their um, bats in the wild. Yeah, yeah. So they don't, so they, they catch them. And then, uh, so those are the, the studies that they showed us that, for example, there are grid cells um, forming an hexagonal pattern you know, on the floor um, from the animal crawling. So the animal can walk through, right? You know, it doesn't just fly. And so the fact that there are grid cells, those are, I mean, if I remember correctly, those are animals that were wild. So they grew up in the wild. Yeah, um, those are wild animals. yeah so there is that. But yeah, people are sensitive to this uh, problem. The Mosers, for example, you know, one question is that, do the, does the grid maybe have something to do with the animal always living in a cage that typically ha is made of 90 degree angle, right? And so they went through, I think, a really difficult experiment of raising them in a sort of, I think, a concave um, arena since birth. And, and they still saw that, you know, grid cells are pretty sturdy. So, um, you know, just to inform that question. It, it, I mean, I thought of it when you had mentioned the the cab drivers, the London cab driver studies, and there must be some into, I mean, the, the, the quality of the data and the granularity of that data is so poor compared to anything that you guys do in the lab, but I wonder what intuitions one would have about looking at sort of the stepwise progression of representations in the system. And, you know, are there any that you can glean? Can I say that another way? I think it's a, a same question. If you could measure grid cells and place cells in the hippocampus of a London cab driver. And let's say we could, and we did, and we had a bunch of it. Well, would we know what to do with the data, how to analyze it? Would, would that be a worthwhile? Yes, that study? is the question I wanted to ask, but I thought you would scoff at human studies. And then we start talking about that. Well, anyway, go ahead. Same thing in a mole yeah. rat. Imagine we did yeah. it in wild mole rat living mm -hmm. in one of those labyrinth things. Uh, burrows that you are describing before. It's the same same imaginary problem. Right. So so I think those studies are really worth doing, but at the same time, I think we are limited by the tools uh, that that we have. Uh, uh, so 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 it requires a lot of uh, technological advancement in terms of like. Uh, or, or even con conceptual advancement, right? Uh, so uh, I would say like the, the general uh, paradigm in place field uh, uh, is, uh, is you make a rat hungry and then you sprinkle food around and the animal forages around. Or you have food uh, distributed along a track or at the end of the track and the animal goes back and forth between the two ends where there is food or you have specific goal locations at which you place food and that's it. Whereas in real life, the motivations are coming from the animal and those motivations are changing all the time, right? Uh, so a technological advan advance that needs to happen, for example, is being able to uh, keep track of the animal for prolonged periods of time uh, so that different behavioral motivations can repeat themselves and you can see like, okay, now it looks like the animal is motivated for food. Here, the animal is motivated to go about sex or it, it's trying to run away from a predator. Uh, it's just sleepy and looking for a shelter and so on, right? Uh, so, so you need to be able to both understand the motivation of the animal and at the same time have uh, ability to record for long enough period of time so that you can replicate same motivations multiple uh, 
uh, number of times. You need to be able to position the animal. So, so typically, as I was saying, you use single cameras. Now, we've started using multiple cameras, and we consciously made that decision. Like in large spaces, we had the option of just using a fisheye lens to keep track of the animal in large environment. But we figured if we force ourselves to use multiple cameras, not only does it help us track the animal in large environment, but it gets us used to using multiple cameras such that we don't have to start worrying about uh, obstructions in the environment or, uh, or keeping track of the animal as it crosses from one region to the other that one single camera can't keep track of, keeping track of the animal in three-dimensional environments, we can just, instead of having planar array of cameras, you can have three-dimensional array of cameras keeping track of the animal animals there. But we need to even take it beyond, right? In, in real world, we, if you're talking about burrows and, uh, and animals running in the undergrowth and things like that, you're not going to be able to use anything like a, like a camera or even a radio tracker will not be that great. So now, We'll need to uh, this sort of start start making our own devices that that use self motion like accelerometers and so on that can interface with other devices like radio trackers or cameras and so on so so as to uh, anchor them in in real space but so that you can correct that information but but you, you need you need much more complex system. I mean, even if you even if we are thinking about the simplest of uh, paradigms in 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 terms of what is the minimum it will take for us to look at what the animal does in real world, uh, we already need. It's possible, but it it needs to be pushed. It's not. I have this paradigm in the lab, and I'll just take it outside and it'll work. Speaking of pushing systems, I know we're pushing you so far beyond the hours of reasonable thought. Uh, it's probably like 1 a.m. there right now. But I want to address this question to because I'm perseverating on this because I'm just curious what the two of you will say. If we were to, so, and I don't know the literature deeply, but in as much as we think that there are fundamental differences between the London cabbies hippocampus and the naive regular person's hippocampus, um, I don't know what those differences are exactly and how they're measured. What do, why do you guys think there is a difference? Is this based on the, the process of retrieval? Is it based upon something about how they, some cortical capacity, change? like why do you think those things are different based on the deep knowledge you have of, of this system? And what do you think they are? I mean, I don't even know that those differences are real. Which one are the two things that you're comparing? Sorry, can you do the regular people in the London cabbie? Because there's always oh. this this dogmatic thing that well they have bigger hippocampi and they're they have a you know their hip, their hippocampus lights up more or there's some sort of measure that that's claiming that there's some fundamental difference in the process that they use to think about space. I don't know that it's completely limited to the hippocampus itself, but I mean I have heard that I should have prepared by reading that study, but. Um, I mean, is, is there any thought about what fundamentally changes with experience in the in the circuit? And I know the, these are these are. I'm not talking about what you can figure out experimentally. I'm just thinking conceptually. In what is your thought about what changes with experience, if anything? You know, maybe they have a bigger hippocampus because they have to remember the name of every single street in London. You know, the exam is supposed so it's not spatial. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, the, the hippocampus in humans, like, is involved in you know other memory functions. So I mean, it just goes back to this idea: of what is, you know, memory? How is it involved? Is it because memory is fundamentally spatial? Is a form of navigation, even in abstract concepts, or is it? Just that you know, space is a particular case of something you remember, and and rats are it's particularly salient for salient for rats, and uh, you know people have discussed this for a long time. But you know you also have to remember those, that taxi driver has to remember a lot of streets because well, everything you know makes your ah, very hard. Everything you know causes takes up a certain amount of space, and if you know lots of things, then the space in in your brain has to, volume of your brain has to increase. Is that 
No, I don't know. I don't know about that. I wouldn't. So, so I, I have to say this, I mean, and, and this is kind of uh, more of a bias, I, I guess, on my part rather than uh, knowledge of things per se. But but I, I kind of find this notion that if something is is required and used, it, it needs to get bigger itself kind of uh, problematic. I mean, you really don't need more hardware uh, to do a task like if, especially if you're training a system to do the same task, uh, you can use the same hardware that you have. You just wire it slightly differently and you should be able to do do things much, much more efficiently than a system that is uh, rather randomly wired. So that does not necessarily mean you need more neurons, more connections or some, things like that. It just might mean you need different connections uh, to form. Um, so, so the taxi drivers like uh, Francesco just mentioned, one possible reason why they have bigger hippocampi might be something completely different. But the other, other thing might be that you're just looking at people who have actually cleared that exam. That just might be people who have inherently got bigger hippocampi to begin with. Uh, for maybe for something com completely unrelated reasons. It's not like uh, the experiments had followed uh, individuals uh, from long before they decided to become the taxi driver and started uh, uh, staring at the maps or driving around London uh, for quite some time. So, so I, I really don't know how much uh, uh, weight to to put in uh, uh, put in that? Uh, but but just coming from my bias of uh, of can you train the system to do a lot of things without actually adding too much hardware? And my thing, my bias would be to think that yes, you probably can. Uh, I'm not sure what it all means. Really. Yeah, I I didn't mean to to fixate on the, the larger hippocampi thing. But I think what you said was compelling. If you need to make a system more efficient, or if you if you need to build more flexible types of representation to represent more things, you can imagine that those rep representations would sort of need to be pushed further and to represent more things in different contexts mm -hmm. quicker or would offload that process somewhere else or once it was mastered or something. So um, yeah, it's it's super interesting this this idea of complexity and how it how it's managed and and, and how you're going to be studying it. Um, so that that's really interesting that, that you're looking at these these more naturalistic things with the little wireless devices and mm -hmm. and hopefully going into the wild at some point. That would be great. Um, Thank you very much. I know it's super late and this has gone very long. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, heroic late night podcast with Sachin Deshmukh here, everyone. And thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Francesco. This is Neuroscientist Talk Shop. Thank you very much.